Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of an interview series with me, Ian Robson from My Farm Education. And today I'm joined again by Joe Dickinson from Dickinson Farms. Say hello, Joe. Hi, Ian. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, silage. Uh, I had a few questions about silage, and I didn't know anything about it, so I thought I would talk to someone who actually uses uh, deals with silage on a regular basis. So Joe is a beef farmer, is that correct, Joe? Um, I'm a beef farmer, but I also have some roots in the dairy industry, so... So you've seen it a, a, both sides to a certain extent then, yep. so... Awesome, so he's an expert, way more of an expert than I am. <laughs> okay. expert would be a bit of a stretch, but... <laughs> well, in comparison to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's jump into the first question. So what exactly is silage, Joe? Okay, silage is a, is a full crop that's been chopped up green, stored in an oxygen-limited environment, and then fed out later on. So it's more moist, it's fermented, and that's where the animals are going to get their feed is, is from that fermented product. Okay. And I know there are different ways to ferment uh, silage. Uh, for example, if I remember correctly, um, you can also do baleage, I think they call it sometimes. Yep. So could you talk about the difference between, like, I guess, silage and baleage and haylage, I guess? Well, um, baleage, it's, it's not fermented differently. Okay. The fermentation process is the same any way you're talking about silage. The difference with baleage versus silage versus haylage is more storage. Um, most, in my experience, most times baleage is haylage. It's just baled a little drier than you would normally chop the haylage, and then okay. it's stored in bales. Okay, so let me get this straight. So baleage is a little bit wetter than haylage. Is that other way is that, around? Other way around. around. Other way around. So. Haylage is wetter than baleage. Yes. Okay. Uh, so just it's so it's slightly wetter depending on I guess what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And in that scenario, I guess what you would be doing is you'd be wrapping the bales. Is that correct? That's right. Basically, what you're doing is you're shrink wrapping the bales. So, the the reason I did it this year, um, last year I had the opportunity to buy a wrapper, so. I decided it was probably a good thing to have. Okay. And first cut is very difficult to dry down here. And in a lot of places because one, when you're doing first cut of hay, that's generally you're not into the droughty period of the summer. So it's very hard to get a long dry spell to dry out your hay. The second problem that you run into a lot of the times with first cut is it's generally a bigger volume. Mm -hmm. And the larger the volume, the harder it is to dry the windrow. And if you can't dry the windrow, you can't make dry hay. Makes sense. So that means that if you're dealing with a time crunch, the best way to get that hay off the ground is either to do haylage or bale it wet and do baleage. Cool. So it just depends, like, uh, like in your situation, if you didn't have animals, for example, uh, then you probably want the hay to be dry. But in your case, because you do have animals, uh, bailing it wet or doing haylage with it is a, a better solution for you. Is that would that make sense? Uh, yes and no, Ian. Um, oh, okay. Dry hay transports a lot easier. So if you are selling it, you want to do dry hay as much. Yeah, as yeah, hay. that's what I meant. Like if you dry but, it down, that's the best way to do it, I guess. But that being said, um, depending on the different types of wrappers out there, you can theoretically sell baleage. Oh, I never thought of that actually. Is there so, a big market for that at all? There would be at times. It, it would depend on the year. It would depend on. Um, what everybody's crop was and everything else, but if you had individually wrapped bales, you could theoretically ship them wrapped. 
Hmm. How long would they last for if they were wrapped? If they're wrapped, they'll last. The problem is if if you get a breach in the in the wrapping. Yeah, like if you puncture it somehow. That's right. So they'll last like upwards of a year, more than a year. Oh yeah. Yep. Oh wow, crazy. Yeah. And a random question on top of that. So how much would you sell like a a wrapped bale for then? Let's say it's a four by four round bale. Well, thankfully, I've never had to worry about that, so I could. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so let's move on to the next question. So how do you make silage? So we touched on this a little bit already. So in your case, you said you wrapped some bales, and that's how you made silage. In that, well, in that case, that was haylage. That was baleage. Baleage. Sorry, yeah. i got to get that straight. Baleage. Okay, so in your case, you made baleage. So what about silage specifically? How would, you, how would you go about making that? You mentioned about chopping. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Sure. Um, there's, a, there's a machine called a forage harvester, which is the main way of doing silage. And what it does, it, it either pulls behind the tractor or it drives itself, depending on how big you have. And it will go and it will take the crop. If you're talking about corn silage or if you're talking about some, the way they do sorghum down in the States, you'll cut it standing and and then it'll chop it up into really fine pieces, mm-hmm. blast it into a wagon of some sort and then you'll take it to the silo and put it in. Cool. Um. So you mentioned about uh, sorghum a little bit, and so I want to kind of touch on the different types of silage. So uh, as far as I know, there is corn silage, and then there's sorghum silage. Are there any other, t- any other types of silage uh, that you know of uh, that we can grow in Ontario? Well, technically, haylage is a silage. Okay, so haylage is when you chop haylage. up grass. Uh, no, that's grass silage. Grass silage. Uh, <laughs> Haylage, haylage will have some level of legume in it. Oh, okay. So, so it will have alfalfa normally in, in Ontario. You'll have alfalfa as being your legume. And it's done a little bit wetter than, say, grass silage. Okay. And when I worked out, when I went to school in Alberta, they always talked about alfalfa silage. Okay. It confused me because to me alfalfa silage was haylage. Yeah. yeah. But it's the moisture content. So okay, alfalfa so depending silage on the moisture. is drier than haylage. But alfalfa is, as I understand it, difficult to dry down. It can be. It can be. Well, I'd say no. I think from what I've heard in Ontario, at least it can be a little difficult. It can be. You are. But yeah. but by the same token, it's well worth having in your hay mix. Yeah, yeah. And by hay mix, you mean like what you have planted in the field in terms of the different seed groups. So, for example, I think That's you mentioned alfalfa, so a trefoil might be another possible. A fescue grass might be another one, if I remember right. Yeah, uh, most of around here until fairly recently, so say the last 15, 20 years, yep. this place was well known for growing tree foil. Oh. The the heavier clay made it perfect for that, that sort of situation. But as they got more wet resistant alfalfa, mm-hmm. the alfalfa yields better, the cows like it better, it dries better. So guys went to it instead of the um, instead of the tree foil. You still see some around. But yeah. it's been relegated more as a pasture grass than it is anything now. Around if here. I remember right, trefoil isn't good for horses. Do you know anything about that? Um, I don't know enough about it to talk okay. about that. Yeah, sure. I decided to ask. It came up. So. But I have done some horse hay with trefoil in it. Okay. The, the problem's more with... Um, it's It's got a different flavor. And I think that's more the issue than anything else. Okay, so horses can be picky, so they don't like the flavor. They'll just be like, yeah, I'm not going to have that. <laughs> that's right. 
Cool. Uh, so what types of silage do you use on your farms? I guess you use a combination of more than just silage itself. So could you tell me about yeah. what types of silage you use on your farm and why you decided to use those types? Well, this year I've done baleage. That was my first cut of hay. Mm -hmm. And then on my new seeding I did sorghum silage. I followed that up with some clover silage. And then I did more sorghum silage. I also did some third cut haylage. And then I topped it off with corn silage. Okay, so why did you choose to do uh, those, those different types of silage and haylage? Okay, well the, um, the reason I did the baleage, the variety of hay that I use is one where you got to get the field cleared within five days. Okay. If you don't have that field cleared within five days, you're going to be restricting the next cut. So oh, you okay. So you your your feed underneath, which is a problem when you're looking at second, third, fourth, and sometimes even fifth cut. Oh, so wow. you want to make sure you get everything off. And the only way I could do that was either silage or baleage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I could do baleage by myself. Okay. Silage, in order to get things going as well as you'd like, I need two to three people to do haylage. So. Okay, so sometimes it's a question of having the, the manpower available. Sometimes it's a question of what you're growing. So in your case, you had to get that stuff off the field that's ASAP right. within five days, so that's why you went that route. Yeah. And what about the, the sorghum? Well, I use sorghum as a as a nurse crop for my new crop of hay. Could you uh, explain what a nurse crop is? Sure. So basically what it is, it's it's a type of cover crop. Okay. When you plant hay, you generally don't get any sort of reasonable yield until later on in the year and you're not going to see much. But okay. if you put a nurse crop over top of it, so you plant them at the same time and mm -hmm. it grows up, then what happens is you're able to take that crop as your feed until the alfalfa establishes. Oh, cool. I didn't know you could do that. So yeah. you plant them at the same time. So you plant your sorghum. In this case, you plant, planted sorghum, and then you planted your, your hay seed. Yep. And then what happens is the sorghum grows faster than the hay, so then you take off the sorghum, and you only get one cut of sorghum, or you can you get multiples? I got two. Okay, so it grows back up again after you cut it. Yeah, yeah, it okay. actually grows really fast. <laughs> okay, so you do. So you, in your case, you did one cut of sorghum, and then you did a hay, and then you did a sorghum again this year, I guess. Yeah, the, there was a field right beside it that was hay. So when we did the second cut of sorghum, we did the hay at the same time, and oh. we just put them both up. Awesome, cool. And um, let's move on a little bit to talk about uh, storage. So how exactly do you store silage? I know we talked a little bit on Twitter about storing silage in a vertical silo. Could you talk about the differences between uh, storing it vertically in, in a vertical silo or horizontally in a bunker style? Sure. There's, there's a number of different ways of storing silage. The, as I said, the key with silage is you want to make sure it's in an oxygen limiting environment. Okay. So that can be done with bags. That can be done with shrink wrap. That's why I did baleage. Mm -hmm. It can be done vertically and it can be done in box. Those are the main ways that you'll see silage done around here. Okay. And for a bunker, you would have to put some sort of tarp or something over it to help reduce the amount of oxygen, right? That's right, yeah. Okay. And do you have to do anything like that in a vertical silo, or is just the fact that it's in the silo fine and fine? Well, it depends on the type of silo you have. If you're okay. driving around and you see those blue silos when you're yeah. driving around, they're oxygen limiting themselves. And okay. They're what's called a closed silo, so you don't have to put anything over the top. And the nice thing about those ones is you're always feeding 
fermented feed. So, so the beauty of that is what happens is you unload from the bottom mm -hmm. where the big cement ones that you see everywhere are what's called open top silos and they unload from the top. So your newest stuff gets fed last. Oh, okay. Yeah. Newest stuff gets fed last in a closed silo, in an open top, they get fed. It gets fed first. Gotcha. And then the other situation is if you have wrapped bales, basically. Yeah. And then that's just individually. Well, mine are in a tube, but a lot of guys. Oh well, yeah, yeah. There are tube, guys who do individually wrapped. They use a lot more plastic. <laughs> yeah. So there are disadvantages and advantages to that as well. With individual, individually wrapped bales, of course, then you can give them as you need it. Like if you have a smaller herd of sheep or a smaller herd of cows, then having individual works better. But the larger the number of animals you have, it makes a bit more sense to have the big long tube. Just think of them as marshmallows on the side of the road. It's where you tend to see them the most, actually. So, <laughs> well, so we always described them when we were kids, at least. There is that, Ian. But that being said, if you have too small a herd, using baleage is a very bad idea. Okay, why do you say that? Well, because a bale, once you take its wrapper off, doesn't keep very long. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. need to have a big enough herd that they're going to be able to eat it in a fairly short time frame. What kind of time frame? Like five days? You'd want to go less than that. Oh, so if you're feeding, if you're feeding um, four feet by four feet uh, round bales, you'd want it like, I would say three days or less to eat the whole bale. Yep. Oh, okay. Preferably and I don't. Less. Yeah, preferably less. So, so you're basically, depending on how many animals you have, you're basically feeding feeding almost new uh, silage or haylage or baleage every. Almost every day, I guess, is what it boils down to. Yeah. I was feeding three bales a day to, of baleage to my cows and two bales of dry hay as well. Okay. I don't know. Do you know if they have wrappers for small squares as well? That would be... Um, well, actually, if you... I've looked at my baler, and I, I'm pretty sure I could do small squares with it. But you'd have to figure out how to... Um, how to bundle them just right. Yeah, I think the big problem would be uh, the cost associated with wrapping them because they're small squ squares as well. But Exactly. What you yeah. do is you do like the big square guys do, and you'd probably stack them. I'd say you'd probably do a stack of about nine or ten bales together. Now, the downside of that is you still got to feed those nine or ten bales. Yeah. Yeah. in that same time frame as otherwise. Makes sense. So you're not really gaining anything, and all of a sudden you've introduced a heck of a lot more work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, <clears throat> Random question in terms of storage. Uh, so to put the silage, or to put the silage into your silo, mm -hmm. um, or vertical silo, let's say, uh, do you need a special type of auger for that or something to... How would you put it in the silo itself? Actually, we have a little thing called a blower. Oh, okay. And so we'll have, we'll have a wagon that unloads at the front, in our case, and that's pretty mm -hmm. standard for forage wagons. And it's got some beaters on the front, and they kind of pull away at the load and then drop it into either an auger or a cross chain and then it'll drop it into the blower. That blower is going to just blow it straight up some pipes, and it'll go through a distributor and go out into the silo. Okay. Not as complicated as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> no, it's it's pretty simple. It's It takes a fair amount of horsepower, but... Yeah, I imagine it would. Cool. Um... So what types of animals actually need silage? So, for example, you have cows, both, well, you have beef cows, and I believe your father has dairy cows. So do both those types of animals need silage, and why do they need the silage? Neither need it. 
Okay. You can get by on dry feed, but dairy cows do much better with silage than they do on a full dry ration. And by much better, you mean produce more milk, correct? Exactly. They can produce more milk. They can produce it more efficiently. And so long as you manage your silage and and your grains correctly, you can do it with very minimal to almost no problems. Cool. And the beef cattle, the same same scenario. They can get by quite easily on dry hay. I've been here on this farm for five years. This is my third year using the silo. So <clears throat> you said beef cattle can get by without using uh, silage. So why did you choose to start using it then, out of curiosity? Well, there's a few reasons for it. First of all, I was short on feed, so you can't really do corn stock bales and, and feed them and get the same quality as you would from silage. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't even be close. So I needed more feed. The corn silage was there. We put her up. And sorghum doesn't dry down very well, so it's a better candidate for silage than it is for dry baling as well. You can actually but dry bale The other sorghum reason well. is... Not in my experience. It doesn't <clears throat> I was going to say, I'm like, I've never heard of that, but... <laughs> so, generally, you don't bale it. Let's say that. Yeah. I've got neighbors who do baleage of sorghum. Mm -hmm. But baleage and dry bales are different, and we've already established that. Um, the other thing is, I have a 24-foot diameter by 70 feet tall silo. That holds a lot of feed. Yeah. And <laughs> when I moved here, <clears throat> I was feeding dry bales, and I was feeding them at the tone of about four to five bales a day. Of dry rounds, I suppose? Yeah. So if you sit down and you think about that for a minute... At four to five bales a day, and those were four by five bales. Oh, so they're a bit bigger too, eh? Jeez. The, the cows come off the pasture in September because hunting season starts in October, and I don't want my cows being mistaken for deer. Yes, that's and, a good reason. <laughs> and then they don't go back onto pasture until May because the spring floods flood their pasture. Mm -hmm. So... I have to have about seven months of feet at my place. Ooh, that's a bit rough. So with that in mind, if you were to sit down and actually work out the numbers, you'd figure out that the square footage of storage needed for dry feed would be ridiculous. Yeah. Let me just do the math here quickly. You said five <laughs> bales a day. Um... Five bales a day, so let's say seven months times 30 days, so 210 days roughly times five. So you're looking at 1,050 bales of yeah. four by fives, which four is by a lot. Five. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that's four feet by five feet for anybody who doesn't know, and the amount of storage you would need for that many bales is quite a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a lot. So... Yeah, so diameter, or how many? How much length would be, so times five would be, you need about, if you were to like, put them up side by side, you need about 5,250 feet, which is a lot. Yeah. So Too much, basically. You can stack them, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, but you yeah. can only stack them so high. So in this case, it makes a lot more sense for you, you to use the silo that you have available to you. That's right. And the other, the other thing is, it can speed up my feeding, because by feeding them both bales and silage, mm -hmm. I can feed them once a day instead of feeding them twice a day. And so if I have to go away, this makes it a lot easier on my neighbors or my parents because all of a sudden they don't have to come here twice a day, they have to come here once a day. And Makes I can sense. focus on catching up on book work or that 
if I'm at home doing field work, all that sort of thing, if, if I'm feeding them once a day. Makes a lot of sense. Keeps you, uh, gives you the ability to do other things. That's right. Cool. Uh, so last question, is there anything I didn't ask you about silage that new farmers should know about silage? I think probably the, the only thing would be relative feed values between the different types. Mm -hmm. um, because not all silage is created equal. Of course. And very, in a lot of ways, silage is very much like wine. And they're both fermented products, and they both are affected by the growing season with which they came from. So you can run into years where you may have more toxins in, in the silage because that's what was in the atmosphere at that time. Mm -hmm. you, you may run into times where it was just a really crappy year for getting anything done and the quality just doesn't do as well. Or if you have a killer drought like they had in the Midwest last year, yeah. That's going to negatively affect the quality of your corn silage, if you're doing corn silage. Mm -hmm. Haylage, it will affect the volume, big time. So that's that's one of the big differences over, over the course of the year, because it can change from one year to the next, and it can even change from one part of the year to the next. Yeah, and that's that's why it's so important to... Uh, just like having a, a financial portfolio to diversify your silage portfolio, I guess it would be kind of yep. yeah. same idea. Now, Reduce now the risk. Me, yeah. For me, it was more a case of, well, I still needed more feed, and oh, here's some more feed here. Let's put it up the silo because in the case of the clover silage, it wasn't going to dry. So clover is notoriously difficult to dry. So we chopped it and blew it up the pipe instead. And the corn silage was, well, not sure if I quite have enough feed, so let's take another 15 acres of feed out of rotation and chop it and put it up the silo instead yeah. of turning it into dry corn and selling some of the kernels. You do what you got to do, right? Well, that's right. Cool. And if you're going to have livestock, they got to come first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I know some people try to uh, keep their animals out on pasture for longer, uh, as opposed to feeding them things like silage and baleage and whatnot. But that all depends on where you are. In Ontario, you get snow pretty early on, so depending on how much snow you have and what type of animals you have, there's only so long they can stay out there. So, well, it's animals can handle the snow quite easily. But it's a question of how much food. There was a lot of barns. There was a lot of barns that weren't big enough to hold more than say ten or fifteen cows. Yeah. But they'd have a herd of two hundred. <laughs> it's there just in case. <laughs> Calving. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I guess that makes sense. Or if they had a sleeping animal. Yeah, yeah. I know some so, people. I know some people go the route of. Uh, not it's not common, but I've heard some people have let their cows calve out in the fields. Um, yep. Maybe it's more with sheep, but it just depends on preferences and whatnot. Well, it depends on where you are. It depends on what the weather's like. Yeah. And yeah. most times, it's a lot easier to calve out on grass. But mm -hmm. if you have high levels of predation, you may want to have them in. Or if all of a sudden you get a cold snap. You want to get that calf inside, get it warmed up before you get it back outside. So, yeah. so no, ant, cattle, cattle, sheep, those sorts of animals, they're fully functional being outside in the cold. Because you look at their cousins, <clears throat> also known as deer. Yep. We don't put them in barns. No. <clears throat> So, with that in mind, they can handle it, but sometimes, sometimes it's a case of 
how expensive is your land? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, so. The land that I'd be putting my cows in, or my cows on, in the winter months is too expensive to do something that's not going to be somewhat intensive. Yeah. Snow is not an issue here. We yeah. don't have an issue. Well, we're starting to veer a bit away from the silage, yeah. so I'll stop the conversation there for now. <laughs> uh, that'll be another topic for another talk, I'm sure. Um, so, Joe, thank you so much. Uh, Joe is from Dickinson, Dickinson Farms down in, it's not Guelph, is it? Oil Springs. Oil Springs. Oil Springs, Ontario. If you want to check them out, dickinsonfarms.com. Dot com. Cool. My name is Ian Robson from My Farm Education. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll talk to you guys next time.